when it's not making, you know, money has never been the thing. It's been the music and the people and the transfer of the music between the people. And you, uh, it's one of those things where you, you know, your best memories and of everything is the people you met and the places you've been and the tunes that you learned to play. Right. And that's pretty much, if you can do that, uh, however much money you have or don't have, really doesn't matter. Right. It's right. the tunes that matter and the people who play them. Fiddlin', banjo, Billy, thank you for being on Old Time Central. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's an honor. Um, Good likewise. <laughs> We just got done uh, listening to an amazing show that was really entertaining and a lot of fun here at the Ozark Folk Center. Thank you. Um, can you tell me how you got into playing old time? Um, yeah, I actually can. Um, I was living in Colorado at the time, and um, a fellow from New York. Actually, I met two people from New York, and uh, one guy... Uh, he uh, became my banjo-making partner, and another, a friend of his, came to visit in Colorado. With him, he brought his grandmother's fiddle, because he thought, I'm going west, and I'm going to travel out there and see my friend, and I'll take the fiddle. Maybe somebody can show me how to play it or something. So Herbie Combs was his name, and Herbie, uh, I met him in Oak Creek, Colorado, and I said, what do you got there? And he said, well, I was a fiddle. And my grandma played it when she was a little kid. So this was an old violin to start with. And so I said, what are you going to do with it? And he said, well, nothing. I don't know how to play it. So I said, well, I'm interested in learning how to play it. Um, you know, what if I could learn how to play it? And he said, I'd give it to you if you could learn how to play it. I said, okay, let me borrow it for a couple of weeks and I'll see if I can get it and, you know, make up some tunes. And how old were you then? Hey, 21. Okay. And so I made up my, the first tune called the Oak Creek Two-Step, which is in my book. Anyway, uh, so I made that tune up. And I, when I was out west there, I was looking for other fiddlers. And they were really hard to find. And I did find one old fella, Frank Miles, who taught me a couple tunes and came in, into town and would play with me and whatever. But anyway, I was looking for old-time fiddlers in northwestern Colorado, and there weren't hardly any. Right. Anyway, so then um, as time went on, I moved here to the Ozarks. Um, but the, so I brought the fiddle back and said, well, here's a tune. I made this up. And he said, well, you can just have it then. You know how to play it. And I said, well, don't you want me to show you or something? He said, no. You, the deal was you could have it if you learned to play it. I said, okay, thanks. You still have the fiddle? No, but uh, I know who has that fiddle. Okay. It's a, a Carlo Bergonzi fiddle. It's a little bit smaller than things. Anyway, it's a pretty old one. Um, I don't know how much it was worth, but um, I played it and kept it for years and years. Dropped it a couple of times, cracked it several times, fixed it several times. Anyway, that was what I had to learn on. Somebody gave me a fiddle. Cool. Yeah. So that when was. When did you come to the Ozarks? It's 1975. Okay. Yeah. There were a lot more fiddlers around here. Well, there, it was hard to find them. Really? And it wasn't until 76, 1976, yeah, when I got told about picking and gridding on the Courthouse Square in Mountain View, Arkansas. So I came here in 1976 and actually sold one of my banjo number four that I had made. Okay. And I sold it here and ran into a whole bunch of fiddlers and banjo players. Mm -hmm. And I've been coming here for the last 45 years. The Pagan Rites in D minor. <laughs> Thank you. 
So that got started all the way back in the 70s. Yeah, in 1974 in Oak Creek, Colorado. And we called it the Phippsburg Banjo Company. Phippsburg was down on the other side of Yampa, of the Yampa River, about four miles away. And it was a place where, the, where all the coal trains went by. So there was a store and a hotel and a bunch of little railroad shacks. And that's where I met my friend from New York, John Walsh. And we were both banjo players and we would nudge each other and say, you know, we could make better banjos than we're playing. We could actually make better ones. Okay. These are not that good. And they don't stay in tune and this... Anyway, so we decided, we embarked on the thing, we were going to make banjos. Mm. And that's all we knew about it. And we learned. And John would make a mistake and I'd see it and say, I'm not making that mistake. And he said, yeah, well, I'm not making that other one where you wasted all that wood. You know, and so we had this thing going on between us. You guys had a workshop? There? And we had a workshop that we uh, started in Oak Creek, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Right. Then we moved the whole thing to southern Carroll County in the Ozarks mm -hmm. because you could get wood almost free. Okay. What kinds of woods were you building? Just well, walnut and ash. And we would have to import maple that we would yeah. get from hardwood dealers and stuff. Um, but mostly walnut. Mostly walnut and cherry, American cherry. Mm. Um, so anyway, we both uh, made banjos for a few years in Arkansas. And then uh, John decided he was going to, he went to Spring Hill, Tennessee, to guitar making school. Okay. And then he came back with his notebook, 650 steps of how to make a guitar. And John started, he made six guitars and sold them all right away. Right. And he said, I guess I'm going back to Colorado. So he moved back to Colorado, and he's still Cimarron Luthiers. Okay. And John's a guitar maker in Ridgeway, Colorado. Nice. He's still making guitars. And he left you to build the banjos. And he left me to build the banjos. So I did build the banjos. Anyway, here is one Ooh, you can look at. Uh, this is my banjo. Oops. The one that I play oh, when I play. Uh, I got a capo that's on the back. And you put this in the back of it. Uh, it was too loud or something, I guess. Anyway, yeah, there is a banjo. And uh, this one's made out of walnut. And so uh, I learned how I taught myself how to actually bend laminate pieces around in a circle. And so first I had... Strips you bent around to form and then... I actually bent in an outside mold. Okay. So I put it on the inside. Mm -hmm. But I had to figure out how to make a, a steaming box where sure. I could, and how big to cut the wood on my table saw yeah. for whatever kind of wood it was to see how, where it would bend, where it would break. Sure. A lot of Kenlin wood uh, on pieces that you said, yeah, this is a great piece, and then, oh no, and it breaks. So you gotta have it hot and do it quick. Anyway, so underneath this cap here, there's five pieces bent around in a circle. Yeah. One at a time, then they dry, then you glue one to the other, then you wait for that to dry, then you glue another one to that, and all the way till you're done. Right. On the rim, then you gotta sand it. Right. Yeah, anyway, and then you make the neck and all sorts of things. Beautiful. So yeah, the necks are like usually two pieces put together. So you learned it the American way, just do it yourself. Yeah. Just do it yourself. And so I did. Mistakes. Learn from mistakes. Yeah, and this is banjo number 12 or number 8. I can't remember. This is the one I always play whenever I play, but I let Christine play it because it sounds really good. But anyway, and on this one, yeah, this is walnut I got from a local sawmill three miles down the dirt road from my house. 
And, uh, and I did some carving on the back of it yeah. with just one tool. Made this design. Anyway, these banjos sound great and they play great. And that's how they sound. When they're in tune, they play wonderful. Okay, the, uh, yeah, here's a tune um, <clears throat> called uh, Gonna Rise Again. This I made this one up a long time ago. Um. started out by writing one tune since then you've learned several hundred tunes what's your, yeah all right what's your what's the, the method to your madness how do you how do you pick up tunes um i hear them when i go places like i've always have done um so i make it a point to go where there's fiddling going on so at clifftop i've been there uh, a few different times that's the big one though and uh, usually during the year i will come here to mountain view to the folk festival in April, and then also where we go to Battleground, Indiana, for the fiddlers gathering up there. Mm -hmm. And then we also do a thing called Breaking Up Winter, mm -hmm. which is at the um, the state park over there in Lebanon, uh, Tennessee, mm -hmm. right outside of Nashville. Anyway, and and those people. So when we go over there, there's people that come up from Chattanooga, there's people from Georgia, there's people from Florida, South and North Carolina. Anyway, all that region is represented, so it's nice to go there, see what they're playing, and meet them and play with them. But it's nice to go to the battleground and see who's playing what with the Chicago gang and all those people. And so I met uh, many different fiddlers that I've been, you know, fiddling friends with for years and years. Uh, there's a bunch of them. They're in the book, but, um, you know, specifically people like Gary Harrison. Sure. You may have heard of him. Mm -hmm. Chirp Smith. Mm -hmm. And me and the Volvo Bob Trotters go way back to, oh boy, yeah, 77 maybe, uh, uh, when uh, Fred came down to go fishing on the White River. And I was down here for a folk festival. And I met Fred, and he taught me a tune called Walk Old Shoe, He'll Come a Dragon. Okay. Anyway, I learned that from Fred off the mandolin. I learned it on the banjo, then I transferred it to the fiddle. And that was way back then. And then ever since then, I would travel north from Arkansas with banjos to sell. And I'd go to festivals up in Iowa, in fact, the Pottawatomie Fairgrounds uh -huh. over there in um, west, way west, uh, Iowa. Sure. And then from there, I'd go up to Michigan and do an old-time festival called Wheatland, mm -hmm. the Wheatland Festival. And I did that for uh, a decade. Mm -hmm. So on my way through to Iowa every year, I'd, then I'd go to Michigan and do Wheatland. So I'd be gone for two and a half weeks. But that was a way that I could, uh, you know, sell my wares, meet a whole bunch of people, and learn all sorts of tunes. And right. 
there's a lot of tunes that went by and I said, nah, that sounds like that. And nah, that kind of sounds like that. Don't need that. I'm looking for something special. Oh, there's one. And so then you just meet people and play in their jams and then say, where did that come from? Right. And they'll most likely tell you, or they got it from another fiddler, or somebody got it from a book and they're playing a specific version. Right. And I didn't know anything about what books you could get because I don't read sheet music. Right, right, right. <laughs> so I wouldn't know. So it's just a history of, I mean, the tunes you know are the, are the history of the people you've played with. Exactly. Exactly right. And do you uh, always associate them then with that? I mean, when you play that tune, you think of the person you learned it from? Oh, sure. Right. Yeah, I, I remember most all of those in my book. I, there's, a, you know, there's a listing in the book of where I got the tune from. Right. And there's a few of them, a handful of them that say, at a jam somewhere, or from a, a 78, or from somebody else's recording. Sure. But that's just a few of them. Yeah. Most of them I learned from the people at the time, right. and then I don't forget the tune, and I don't forget the people. So that's it's, right. it's all about the people and the music, and that's, you know, that's what I've been going in on. And <clears throat> that kind of attitude is is a good way to spread the music around. And you also meet all sorts of people you've never in your lifetime run into. Right. Just like me meeting you. Right. Yeah, because um, you live on, on another continent. Anyway, <laughs> so, but you know people that I know, and that's good enough. That's right, so, absolutely. That's the way it works. Yeah. Uh, I, I made up a tune when I had the, for my first granddaughter, it was born, and then I started thinking, well, now I have another granddaughter, and now I have a grandson. Anyway, and so I have six grandchildren now, but I started with the first one, and I said I should make up a tune for each one of them. And then uh, my daughters got carried away, and there was a bunch of kids all of a sudden, and they, so now I got six of them, so I just made up a tune, say this will cover the rest of them, and called Grandpa's Old Time Waltz. And yeah. But I don't know. I guess, you know, you, it's a certain, uh, certain thing when you get to be a grandfather. It means you had a child of one kind and they procreated and now you got another one. So I don't know. That's how it goes. <laughs> Tell me more about the, the book. 
specifically, I guess, um, my understanding is it began with uh, the CDs. It began with wanting to make recordings of all the, or of many of the tunes yeah. you know, and then the book. So tell me about the right. impetus to, to make the recording. Oh, that's a good story. I'll try to make it short. <laughs> <laughs> if it's good, you can make it long. <laughs> well, Christine and Paul, that I play with, the old-time players, the Breens, and their friend, Richie, who's a friend of mine from Milwaukee. And who else was in on it? Susie, my friend Susie, who's a kind of a fiddler. She's an old-time fiddler. She plays it the way she hears it. And that's what we all do, I guess. But anyway, they all got together. And they bought me a recording device, a little digital Ederol. Mm -hmm. And they gave it to me and said, here. And I said, what am I supposed to do with it? And they said, well, see how many tunes you know. And then they went, oh, no, I wonder how many tunes I really do know. And that's what started the whole thing. So then I said, I got to answer this question. <laughs> how many tunes do I know? So then I went to my, I had a ledger book, a great big old book, that I would write the tune. And on the page for the G tunes, there was G tunes, and then C and D and A and whatever F. And I would write the tunes in that key down in pencil. Just the title. Just the title and the key it's in. Yeah. Right. And because of the title, then I would remember the tune. Mm -hmm. So I'd associate the tune with the title so that I could just say the title and say, oh, yeah, that one is in the key of C and it goes like this and play. And uh, so that was how I got started. So I took it to heart, them giving me the technology to do it. So I took it home and set it up and pushed the button for record and said, Shanghai Rooster, key of G, and that's the first tune in the collection. And I played it, and then as I started doing more and more tunes, I had this whole list that I had started. And there's about 300 tunes maybe in the list. So I started writing them down in another new list. I just keep making lists of things that I remember. And uh, so I'd put them in their keys, but then I'd play the tune and say, well, that's pretty good, but I learned that eight, eight, ten years ago. How did I play it ten years ago when I first learned it? So this is what I'm asking myself. So I said, well, I'll have to deconstruct the whole tune back to what the real basic thing is that I first learned. So that's what I tried to do with all these tunes, is take them back to how I learned them first, mm -hmm. without embellishments, without extra bowing, without stuff. That's tricky. Well, it is tricky to, to say, what have I learned? How much have I added that wasn't there to begin with? Mm -hmm. So then you get a real intuition about your you know, uh, insight onto your, into your own style of playing, sure. of how do you know this and why do you play it that way and what have you done to it since? And like it says in the book, you know, if you're a fiddler, you play them like you want to play them. You learn them how you play, uh, you learn them, and you hear them how you hear them. Right. And everybody's different. Right. Yeah, so I just have a, a, a keen interest for things that I like the sound of. Mm -hmm. And most, when I hear the thing, like at a jam or walking by a jam, I say, wait, that's in F, and that's a really good tune. Wait a minute. And I'll listen from afar. Then I'll walk right over there and say, well, while we're at it, that was really a good tune. What was that called? And will, we ever, will you ever play that again? And they say, sure, come back tomorrow. So when you're in the place where these people are, you can just walk right up and say, I'm a fiddler, and that was a nice tune, and I don't know it at all. Right. And you ask, and they say, sure. Right. And so all you got to do is go there and see them again the next day, and they'll get right to that. What was that tune you wanted? Oh, that one. Sure, this is how it goes. And you could get your fiddle out and play right along. Right. So all you had to do was ask people how it goes, and they were happy to show you. So that's the attitude, you know, that I felt like, well, I have to do that for everybody else. Yeah. So by recording all these tunes the way I first learned them, then uh, it would help other people in the future to first learn them that way before they put their own fiddler's uh, um, axle grease on. Right. Yeah. That's cool. So that's why, that was the whole reason why I decided, 
well, if I can do 500, that would be a good start. <laughs> <laughs> and it says uh, in the book that it was my first 500. Right. So now I've already started doing more. Right. But I've already done another 50 tunes. Wow. And there's only 450 more to go for the next five volumes. Wow. So we'll see how many tunes I can take in uh, during however many years I have left. Sure. And there's no reason to stop now. No, there's bad, there's, there's, there isn't.